in the neighborhood reaction beanie yo 470 seven that in that neighborhood my brothers and sisters as we proceed to give you what you need it is another tuesday and we're about to go back to my brother from another mother and that brother is ryan from tragedy tales Back to Tragedy Tales, y'all. Hope y'all doing excellent day out there today. And I'm glad that you came on back to the channel once again to fuck with the bean. And the title of the video is Naples Nosedive. Five clips before horror. Number 11. Now, I don't know what it is, y'all, but it's like it feel like every freaking time that we get to watch a new video from Ryan, it almost like it do. Not even almost. It do feel like a freaking special occasion or something, man. I don't know, man. I just freaking love this guy channel and I'm just ready to get into it. But before we get into it, being team, y'all know what y'all got to do. Get whatever you may need. Get what you need, please. We back to Ryan from Tragedy Tales. Y'all got what y'all need. Y'all ready to go? Then let's in go. At the drop of a hat, an ordinary day can morph into the extraordinary and the mundane can give way to the macabre. In mere seconds, life can unravel, plunging us into the depths of nightmares. True. Welcome back, folks. I'm Ryan from Tragedy Tales, and this week, yet again, I've tapped into the darkest recesses of the internet to bring you five more truly terrifying clips that were captured right before horror. From a helicopter ride to a wedding that went tragically wrong, to the man who believed he was Jesus, who went on a terrifying rampage. This week, we've got stories from all across the world. So, you know the rules. Sit down, grab a drink, and draw the curtains. Let's get right into it. Oh my God. Get whatever you may need. And Ryan would just spin some real stuff at the beginning of this video, y'all. Because, and this is the best example of what I can say from what he was saying. When you drive it in the car, man, think about all the people who have died in freaking car accidents. You know what I'm saying? Just five, not even five minutes. We can say three. We can say two. One minute before they actually got in that accident and lost their life, they was just probably chilling at a red, like thinking about where they trying to go or trying to get home, thinking about their kids, what they going to eat for dinner, what they going to do this. Like they just living their normal life and then poof, just like that, everything can change for the worse. It's just crazy, man. But at the same time, it's just the life we live. I'm excited for this one, y'all. Let's get to it. Number five. In life, no matter how experienced you are, regardless of how many safeguards in place, regardless of how many eventualities that you plan for, Things can still go awry, and things can go terribly wrong. But it's what you do after the fact that shows who you truly are. With that in mind, this shocking entry brings us to Naples, Florida, on the afternoon of Friday, March the 10th, 2024. That day, five people boarded a Bombardier Challenger 604 private jet for a routine flight 
from the Ohio State University Airport to Naples Municipal Airport in Florida. It was a mundane day for many, but for those aboard, it would soon become a date forever etched in tragedy. Departing from the Ohio State University Airport in Columbus, Ohio, the aircraft carried two passengers, one crew member, and two very experienced pilots. These two pilots were Edward Daniel Murphy and Ian Frederick Hoffman. Murphy, aged 50, and Hoffman, aged 65, boasted extensive experience in the skies, totaling over 10,000 and 24,000 flight hours respectively. Dang. Their expertise instilled confidence in their passengers as they embarked on their journey back to the Naples airport. Like, hey, like, if you want to, you want some pilots to freaking fly you in an airplane, you would pick guys like these who have plenty of freaking experience, plenty of airtime. You know what I'm saying? Freaking piloting planes, thousands of hours. So it's like, no matter who you think you could put your faith in and your trust to still to get you to that destination while you in the air, things still can just get effed up no matter who behind the freaking what is it called a wheel i don't even know what it's called a steering wheel for a plane or whatever no matter who's in that pilot seat man and all the experience they got tragedy still can strike as scheduled at 12 30 pm the engine started and they left the ohio state university airport as the plane soared into the sky the weather was beautiful and everything was going smoothly as they always do in these videos However, around three hours later, as the Challenger approached its destination in Florida, disaster struck with unforgiving swiftness. At approximately eight minutes past three, the Naples control tower cleared the Challenger to land on runway 23. But located approximately six miles from the airport, while on the final approach to Naples airport, within just seconds of one another, the pilots received four major warnings in the cockpit. They had mm. one engine oil pressure warning for each engines, left and right, saying that they were somehow out of oil in both engines. And the fourth and final signal lit up in red, another engine oil warning. Just two minutes later, less than five miles from the runway, at 10 minutes past three, one of the pilots radioed in and said that they'd lost both engines. He said, emergency, making an emergency landing. Okay, uh, Challenger uh, Hopogen 823, lost both engines, emergency, I'm making an emergency landing. Emergency, clear to land, runway 23, is that Hopogen 823? Uh, we're clear to land, but we're not going to make the runway, uh, we've lost both engines. The plane veered towards the ground, right towards the busy Interstate 75 highway. With zero engine power, the plane began tumbling from the sky, but luckily, both pilots were no strangers to emergencies. Mm. Within moments, they were suddenly thrust into a desperate battle against time and fate. Currently suspended 2,000 feet in the air, Murphy and Hoffman made a split-second decision that rather than make it to the airport, they would try and make an emergency landing on Interstate 75. Sacri now, what y'all think about that, man? The fact that they decided to land this plane on the freaking interstate because they really have no other choice like i think they made the right decision but the thing that's kind of bothering me not kind of it is bothering me is the fact that they trying to land this plane on a place look at that look at all those cars out there you know what i'm saying these freaking cars don't know that this freaking plane finna attempt to land literally land on this interstate at the same time so it's like a tricky situation either just because they thinking that we're not going to make it to this airport. And if we don't try to do this, we're going to lose our life. But if we do try to do this land on this highway, we may end other people's lives plus ours. So it's just it did is it in that moment. It's a terrible decision to have to make. And I'm not even blaming them for the decision that they made. I don't know. Let's go. It's getting crazy, y'all. Sacrificing the comfort of a runway for the slim chance of survival. Traveling at 209 kilometers an hour, or around 130 miles an hour, the silent engines spelled impending doom as the Challenger hurtled towards the unforgiving asphalt below. At 10 past three, the passengers braced for impact as the jet made contact with the highway. The plane had plunged 2,000 feet all the way to the ground in less than a minute. 
Ooh. a passing trucker was able to capture the descent and the terrible impact. Still traveling at a very fast speed, the jet touched the ground, completely blocking the southbound lane of Interstate 75. Amidst the chorus of screeching metal, the footage shows the jet barreling across the interstate, pulverizing a car before skidding over a grass shoulder area and slamming into a concrete barrier. The impact scattered pieces of the jet across the interstate like confetti. And oh seconds my. later, it oh. exploded into a maelstrom of flames and destruction, sending oh. a huge plume of black smoke billowing into the sky. This smoke cloud could be seen from miles away. One Naples area resident by the name of Ginny said that all of a sudden she saw black smoke and then she saw the flames. I just gotta say real quick, y'all. This is bad. This is terrible. You know what I'm saying? It, it, it's horrible. But there is one thing I gotta point out. Did y'all see all those cars around the freaking plane while I was landing? All I'm gonna say is this could have been a lot freaking worse, man. It crashed into one car. All it's still bad. But there is a lot of other cars that was right in the vicinity of where this plane landed that this freaking plane could have crashed into too, which would have made it that much worse. But oh my god, man, can you imagine riding down the freaking interstate and a freaking plane just come down in front of you? Dude, what the is going on? Miraculously, amidst the horror, some managed to escape the inferno. Mm. Despite the emergency exit being blocked by fire, passengers and crew scrambled to safety, guided by the cabin attendant who had led them through the open baggage compartment. Drivers who were traveling along in the opposite way that day recorded footage of the plane being ravaged by fire. First responders rushed to the scene to witness pure horror. The entire crash scene was drenched in jet fuel and heavily damaged by the erupting blaze. Sadly, trapped within the twisted wreckage of the cockpit, for pilots Murphy and Hoffman, there would be no salvation. Despite Damn. efforts to retrieve them from the fire, they were both unable to be rescued and perished amongst the flames. This crash... That's elfed up, man. But I'm going to tell y'all one thing, and I, I don't know how they truly feel. It's just how I think that those two guys, those two pilots that lost their lives feel. I think they are satisfied. I'm just trying to say it the best way I can. I think they feel good at the end of the day that they lost their lives and not the passengers. You know what I'm saying? As a, a pilot and then these experienced pirates, pilots, like they've been doing this, this they life. They This is what they love to do. They have ran into problems before, as Ryan was talking about, as far as like engine problems while you're up in the air and stuff. They've been through these situations. This is their passion, flying planes. They would rather for their lives to be taken before the passenger lives, man. So, I mean, I'm just trying to bring something good out of this situation, but it's still sad as hell that they lost their life, though. Let's go. Reached mainstream and international news. But despite that, no one seems to have heard about it. I only heard about it because of a comment. I would have never found this just by searching through Google. Wow. By the end of the day, the fire had been extinguished in the plane leaving the charred fuselage sitting by the side of the road covered in ash so i know what you're all wondering how could this possibly happen how is it even possible to lose oil in two separate engines at the exact same time yeah. and then experience dual engine failure within seconds of each other something just doesn't seem right here no nope. aviation experts and industry veterans alike were baffled by the tragedy unable to come up with a reason as to why both engines had lost power in such rapid succession. Aviation trial attorney Bob Clifford, who has handled private jet and commercial crashes since the late 1970s, said that what occurred here is extraordinarily rare. He said, how do you lose oil pressure in two engines in a row? You just don't lose oil pressure twice. In the aftermath of the crash, Investigators from the National Transport Safety Board descended upon the scene, determined to unravel the mystery behind the catastrophic engine failures. Every fragment of the wreckage was meticulously examined, every detail scrutinized in the pursuit of answers. But sadly, however, despite exhaustive efforts, 
The cause of the dual engine failure was unable to be determined. The Challenger, built in 2004, had been very well maintained and was even recently inspected, holding no obvious mechanical faults. The safety board's investigation extended beyond the physical wreckage, delving into the black box to analyze the cockpit recordings and the flight data, hoping that this data will reveal further clues. However, none of this has been released to the public as of yet. But And it's just one of those ones that just remind you that nothing in life is perfect. You know what I'm saying, man? Not only are... Uh, us as humans, we are not perfect. Freaking machinery, cars, planes, boats, trains, like you, because they have inspections on this stuff and they make sure it may look like it's in tip top condition, but still anything can happen, man. And that's what seemed like happened in this story because you had a pretty much tip top plane working. You had two very freaking experienced pilots, but the freaking engine, both of them ran out of oil. Like, I mean, some, sometimes it's just happened. Long story short, short story long. But this was unbelievable, tragic, and just unlucky. However, if it weren't for the heroic actions of pilot Murphy and Hoffman, who knew exactly what to do in this emergency situation, this crash would have almost certainly claimed all of their lives. They true. are true heroes who gave their lives for their passengers. True. And I salute them for this. But to have both engines fail at the exact same time, what are the chances? It just goes to show the inherent risks of flight and the fragility of just human existence. And it goes back to what I said in my intro, Life can truly turn at the drop of a hat. At the drop of a freaking hat, man. See, I need to stop watching Ryan with y'all, man. Because he make me... I told y'all before, I have never flown in a plane. Then I watch stuff like this. I'm never getting on a goddamn plane, man. Like, oh my God, bro. And yes, those two guys are freaking heroes. Like I was saying, man. If they was able to come back... And I don't know. Maybe they know now in the afterlife. But if they ever was to know that... Our lives had to be sacrificed in order for our passengers' of life to be saved. They would be good with that. And if I was a freaking pilot, I'd be good with that too. Oh, man. That, that's, that, that was just the first one, my brothers and sisters. We got four more to go, man. So let's go. Number four. Talking about life turning at the drop of a hat, this entry continues to be no exception. It begins on the eastern Black Sea coast in a city called Potty, a port city located on the western coast of Georgia, on Wednesday the 7th of February, 2024. That brisk winter morning, at approximately 8.30 a.m., three men gathered at a football stadium in Potty and boarded a Cameron Z315 gas-powered hot air balloon. That day, the three men had planned to do something that no one had done before. They intended to break a distance-traveled world record. This flight was meant to be the first ever hot air balloon flight across Georgia, flying all the way from Potty to the Vashlavani National Park, a distance of around 400 kilometers, or around 250 miles. The three men who intended to break this record were Misho Bidzina Vigili, 52-year-old Polish pilot Krzysztof Zapart, and 70-year-old Georgian pilot Rivas Utoguari. Now, and I have never been in a freaking air balloon either, y'all. High air balloon either. And that I would never get in one of those. Like, dude, I'm never getting in one of those. Like, I feel like an airplane, I'm going to have to at one point if God bless me to get to where I want to in life where I can travel and stuff. But as far, I'm never doing this. I'm never doing it mm -mm -mm. because we finna listen to a terrible story, a tragic story, a tragedy tale from our boy Ryan that's just going to convince me even more. Let's go. Amisho was the only non-pilot in the basket that day as he worked at a Medi TV as a videographer. 52-year-old Christoph was the founder of Balloon Club Swindica and loved hot air balloons. And last but not least, Rivas Utaguari was a veteran and three-time national record holder in ballooning. 
He was actually the president at the National Aeronautics Federation of Georgia and was even the founder of the Sky Travel Group. In the days leading up to that morning, Rivas had posted on his social media several times, showing him building the basket and applying modifications to ensure a smooth flight. In one post, he said, the distance is not very long, but the flight is difficult as it passes mainly over the mountains. Mm. Even up to the night before, as excitement and anticipation bubbled over, Rivas posted to his Facebook, inviting all of his fans and friends to watch the balloon ride live. So, after weeks of preparation, that morning, the three of them suited up and prepared for a lengthy trip. Rivas posted once again to his Facebook, telling folks again where they could watch the journey with photos of the basket ready for flight. As the trio left from a stadium in Potty, this photo was captured. Just like that, they set off. Instantly, they were gliding through the air with grace and precision. After getting some elevation, soon after setting off, Rivas posted another photo to his Facebook. In this final photo, Revas can be seen smiling with Kristoff with clear blue skies and mountains in the distance. This photo was captioned, we took off at 8.30, getting altitude, getting on course. And the thing about that picture, man, is they don't look scared at all. They look like they having the time of their freaking life. But I'm just thinking about if I was up there with them. I, if you let me be in that picture, I'd be looking just like this. Scared little motherfucker looking crazy as hell, man. No, man, I wouldn't do nothing like that. But one thing I was thinking about, y'all, real quick, which makes me so freaking like a hypocrite or contradicting myself or something, is the fact that I love freaking amusement park rides. Like, I would get on the most crazy, insane roller coasters or whatever, exit flags or freaking, um, uh, Universal Studios, Disneyland, Disney World. Like, I love the, the, the adrenaline that that brings me. I love the excitement on getting on, of getting on all those freaking crazy rides that a lot of people would be like, man, you crazy as hell for getting on that. But I love it. Like, it get my blood flowing. But at the same time, get on a plane, get on a hot air balloon, that shit don't get my blood flowing and make my blood freeze up like I'm freaking, freaking have a heart attack or something. I don't know, man. So it's crazy how it just go back to us as humans, man. We like different things and different things get our generally flowing differently. And it's just life, man. And it's just why God is so amazing by making us all so different. Long story short, short story long. So everything looks like it was going as expected. What could possibly go wrong? Well, the balloon made it about two thirds of the way before tragedy struck with brutal force as the three men and the balloon came over the small German village of Assareti, nestled in the southern Georgian countryside, wind speeds picked up significantly. Mm. While they tried to fight it, the men blew drastically off course and it was obvious that this attempt was a failure. So they tried to land. The balloon could be seen by onlookers getting blown all around the place, being blown wildly out of control swaying drastically in the wind. This is when this footage was recorded. You can see the balloon coming into land. It gets closer and closer to the ground and it looks like it's gonna land no problem. But this is when a huge gust of wind swept in, ripping the balloon back off the ground and up oh. into the air. This gust of wind just didn't stop as it blew it dragged them up a hill and they got dangerously close towards a set of high voltage power lines. Oh! Within seconds, the balloon struck the electrified lines and as the wind kept howling, it got caught on the lines and blew in the gust. It then caught on fire, shredding into pieces, soon setting the basket on fire. By the end, there was almost nothing left of the balloon. Now, I can only imagine the horror, knowing that you're being dragged, knowing that there's no way to actually escape. But I don't think any of them thought that this was gonna be this bad. I doubt any of them saw this danger coming. Ambulances rushed to the scene, but horribly, all three men had perished. As a memorial, Medi TV changed its program 
to honor Misho, who had perished in the crash. Revas's daughter, Iron, expressed her love on Facebook, saying that he left with a smile, doing his very beautiful and beloved job, leaving me on the ground. This tragedy was Georgia's first hot air balloon accident in almost two decades. As far as I can tell, there doesn't seem to have been any bad weather forecast on this day, or surely the trip would have been called off. It's just honestly bad luck all around, and to watch it unfold on camera, it's totally shocking. Like seriously, man, the seat, because I was looking at it and when y'all was looking at it, I'm pretty sure y'all was thinking too, like, okay, it looked like it's landing, okay, no problem. And then the freaking wind, man, just carries it back up. And not only that, it's it's um the, the chances of it not only getting carried up by the wind, but actually running into a freaking power line. Like the 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 circums like the, the the chances of all this happening, man, it's just Oh boy, it's just life. And life could just be crazy as hell. Soon after the crash, the Ministry of Internal Affairs launched a probe into the accident, saying that under Article 275 of the Criminal Code, that there had been a violation of flying rules. However, it's not yet been revealed what these violations were. That one just like, dude, just how everything had to happen in order for this tragedy to happen. Like how it had to all lay out. It just sometimes just make you question, man. Like I be saying, y'all, I really do be feeling like that we just all got an eternal clock. Like we got, we got a clock that been going down since the day we was born. And no matter how we perish, no matter when that clock run out, no matter what's the circumstance, when that clock do run out, it run out and you dead. Sometimes it just feel like that, man. Rest in peace to those three guys. <sighs> Let's go to number three. Number three. Your wedding day is supposed to be the happiest day of your life. One that you remember for years to come. But you never expect this to happen. And I remember this one from Lay's Masquerade. Probably like freaking, probably like six months ago or something like that, y'all. And this is going to blow your mind too. This truly shocking footage was captured on the 4th of December 2016 in Sao Paulo, Brazil. That Sunday was a very special day. It was actually the wedding for 32-year-old Rosemir Nascimento Silva and 34-year-old Adderley Damasino. With 300 guests due to arrive, the day had been planned meticulously, but Rosemir was planning something that her husband-to-be was completely unaware of, something that would leave her guests in awe. You see, Rosemir had a childhood dream of swooping into her wedding venue in a helicopter all without people knowing, surprising the guests, ensuring the day was as epic as it could be. This was a dream that Rosemere had organized to fulfill. At the reception, located on the outskirts of Sao Paulo, at around 4 p.m., Rosemere's fiance, Adderley, was standing at the altar with 300 guests eagerly awaiting the bride's epic arrival. This arrival was one that only a handful of guests at the venue were aware was even happening other guests were just told that something epic was happening. As they waited for her at the venue, Rosemere, her brother Silvano, the pilot Peterson Pinheiro, and the wedding photographer Naila Christina Neves, who was actually six months pregnant, hopped into a Robinson 44 helicopter in Uzascu for a scenic. Boy, Ryan sure do know how to freaking set the whole story up and make your heart hurt, man. Like, dude, man. And I'm going to say this, too. I'm never getting in a helicopter. Never. I don't care. I'm, I am will never freaking go nowhere in a helicopter, man. I freaking hate helicopters. I will always he hate helicopters, man. A helicopter is the reason why one of my role models since the, I was a little, little, little itty-bitty child is gone to this day. Kobe Bryant, man. 
For y'all that don't know, Stack the Bean, the Bean comes from Kobe Bean Bryant. That was his middle name, man. That's where I get the Stack the Bean part from. And for y'all that don't know either, Stack actually stands for Stackavelli the Bean. Stackavelli comes from Machiavelli because Tupac Shakur and Kobe Bean Bryant was my role models growing up. And for a helicopter to be the way that Kobe died, it's still unreal to me. But the way uh, Ryan, I don't know how many of y'all have already heard this story before, but the way he's setting it up, it's going gonna, it, it's gonna to hurt, man. It's already hurt me. But let's go. Take flight over the hills and towards the wedding venue. The journey to the outskirts of Sao Paulo was a trip that should have taken around 15 minutes. Sat on the helipad with everything ready to go. This is where the clip begins. The footage shows the bride-to-be and her brother in the back of the helicopter, with the photographer and the pilot in shotgun. It's all sunshines and smiles at takeoff. The weather looks just perfect for flying, it looks beautiful. As the helicopter chops through the air, everyone was smiling, taking in the views, until the camera pans forward, and you can see a huge, ominous wall of fog. Checking the historical weather for that day, I can't see any fog forecast, it was a sunny day with overcast skies predicted, but nothing like this. All on video, the pilot doesn't even consider turning around. He continues plowing forward, straight into the fog. As they enter the wall of fog, anxiety builds in the passengers as the mist enveloped the helicopter. Soon, nobody could see in any direction. They were right in the middle of a cloud. This footage is almost impossible to watch. It makes me so anxious that they can't see a meter in front of them, but the pilot's still continuing. I'm not a pilot, so I have no idea what you should do in this situation, but I don't know, if it was me, I'd just go up in the air and see if I can see anything at all. In this I mean, what do you supposed to do in that situation, y'all? Did y'all see that, man? Like, literally, you can't see nothing right in front of you. It's almost like, and I know all y'all at some point has been driving on the road and freaking in foggy weather where you can't see nothing in front of you, but they in the freaking air. You know what I'm saying, man? You just can't stop your car and wait till you get some visibility or whatever. They at a point where... I don't know. I feel like, could they just hover in the air? But how long could you just hover and stay in one place, man? This is the same thing that killed freaking Kobe, man. Being in the damn air, and it was foggy out, and they ran into a freaking mountain. And it's, it's, it's almost like the same situation, man. Horrible weather conditions. In this case, the pilot carefully navigated through the thick fog when all of a sudden, an alarm goes off, and everyone panics. He can't see nothing in front of him. Leo, this shit do make you anxious. <sighs> Within an instant, the helicopter spiraled out of control and horror ensued. The camera shows frames of pure carnage before colliding into the ground with a huge crash. And then, silence. The recording continues showing the grass with a red flashing light illuminating the ground. A total of eight fire engines rushed to the scene of the crash, but tragically, all four occupants perished on impact, killing Rosemere, her brother, the pilot, and the pregnant photographer. Back at the wedding, the groom, the families, and the other 300 guests waited and waited, and Rosemere and the other missing guests were nowhere to be seen. At this point, the groom had no idea that his fiance had planned to arrive in a helicopter at all. This was all supposed to be a surprise. 60 minutes passed, and the helicopter had not yet arrived at a nearby football field. One of the organizers of the wedding made a phone call and confirmed that it had taken off as expected. This is when pure 
panic began to build. At 6.30pm, with the groom Adderley still standing by the altar, only then did the pastor lean in and break the terrible news to him, causing him to collapse in shock. An investigation was opened into why all of this occurred, and an accident report was released. This report revealed that the flight rules, as well as the guidelines contained in the flight manual, were not properly observed by the pilot. They concluded that the fog had obviously caused loss of visual references and complete loss of awareness of the position of the aircraft. The pilot had no reference as to his trajectory, which ultimately led to the loss of control and the crash. They also discovered that the helicopter involved did not even have a air taxi registration, technically making it an illegal flight. Wow. Despite their investigations, they were unable to determine what exactly caused it to spiral out of control. However, rewatching the haunting video, it's assumed that the pilot hit a tree or the side of the hill while he was descending. As I was saying, man, it's the same thing that happened to Kobe. And I think it was, I want to say, like seven other people on that plane. I mean, on that helicopter with Kobe. His daughter and uh, some adults and some old children, man. And it's just like, dude. I don't know, man. I, I can't blame. I, I feel like there is no one to blame in stories like this, for real, man. It's just horrible weather conditions, man. And I also feel like down on the ground, it may not be foggy, but up in the air, it do be more foggy. And maybe they should have known about the fog. I don't know, man. All I know is stuff like this is just a freaking tragedy. But this was just stupidly tragic. The fact that Rosemere was on the way to her wedding, the fact that it was her childhood dream to do this, it just makes me sad that her dream got her killed. But my heart aches for Adderley, that stood at the altar for hours waiting for news, only to be told that his beloved wife had passed away in a helicopter accident. I personally think the pilot should have turned around and cancelled the moment that he saw the fog, but instead he continued on thinking that his pilot skills could navigate him through no visual references and it cost him his life, the life of an unborn child and three innocent people. Of course, hindsight is 2020, but next time you think about arriving in style to anything, whether that be a skydive, a helicopter, or even a jet ski, perhaps think twice, maybe taking the car ain't so bad. Yeah, man, be careful out here, y'all, when you're trying to do something out of, out of the norm or, you know, a little more extravagant. And I get it because that was her freaking wedding. That's how she wanted to show up and show out. You know what I'm saying? Then you, like Ryan said, you got to think about the husband standing at that altar. He ain't got no idea that she even doing none of this. Man, it's, oh, boy, it's something that'll hunt you for the rest of your life. And I'm pretty sure that that husband going to always think about that day. Well, he's supposed to been got married to his freaking sweetheart and come to find out why he's standing there waiting to actually make it official. He find out that she has passed away. That is terrible, man. That is just a tragedy tale. Let's go to number two. Number two. This downright horrible entry actually begins on Good Friday, April the 19th, 2019, on Addison Street in Tibshelf, Derbyshire. However, this particular Good Friday would be anything but good. On that fateful day, on a quiet street in Tibshelf, 39-year-old Gavin Collins was about to do something that would ruin multiple lives, cause untold misery, and shock the world. Rolling the clocks back to literally the previous day, Gavin had been released from HNP Ranby after serving a four-year prison sentence for burglary, theft, and other dishonesty offenses. Now, Gavin had a troubled past, being in and out of prison all the time, his life marred by mental issues, all shadowed by a long-standing battle with addiction to Class A drugs. Being described as volatile, Gavin was a man haunted by hallucinations. He reported seeing dark shapes and said that his mind would conjure up images of ninjas out to get him, but he accepted ninjas where he lived would be very strange. Inside prison, Gavin would try anything to get into trouble. Finding himself in segregation multiple times, 
setting fire to his cell twice, assaulting prison officers with weapons and fashion knives, and even beginning a riot. Mm. However, despite his terrible behavior behind bars, literally making him the stereotype of a person who should be in prison, Gavin still found himself granted an early release under the home detention curfew scheme, a scheme that allows prisoners to return home to a residence under tag. This dis That's crazy, man. This dude is like the, a, a picture-perfect criminal. Like, there is no reason that you should let a guy out like this. And you pretty much know that he a freaking maniac. Like, this man is crazy. Why would y'all let him back out? I don't give up about that damn ankle bracelet. The fact that you're letting him back out is crazy. Decision to release him would soon unleash chaos. On the morning of April the 19th, it began like any other, but it quickly spiraled into a nightmare. At around 8.45 in the morning, Gavin, propelled by delusion, suddenly barged into a neighbor's home, proclaiming himself as Jesus Christ, before commandeering their car keys and speeding off into the day. This is when this footage was captured. It's unsure that Gavin even knew that he was being recorded, but all captured on dashcam footage Gavin could be seen driving insane. I'm not even sure I can show half of this on here without catching an age restriction, so I'll do my best. But the footage shows Gavin as he raced from his home through the streets of Skegby, Nottinghamshire, his cries of divine identity echoing through the chaos. There's... Jesus Christ! I'll shut you out with the eyesight I've got! Hey, don't beat this! Let's go, bro. Let's go. Are you taught me to drive? Watch me go now. Hey. Hey, please. Oh, oh. Like, seriously, man. How could you let somebody else, somebody out of prison like this, man? It's so crazy. I got a little smile on my face right now. Like, that's literally how ridiculous this is, man. So it's funny that y'all would let somebody out like this. There is no way in hell y'all can't tell me that while he was still locked up, y'all ain't know this man was batshit fucking crazy. Like, he is unhinged. He just stole uh, somebody else's car, broke in their house, stole their keys, and now he driving around like that? This dude is a complete freaking maniac. And y'all let him out? It's almost a joke at this point. What the fuck? All on video, he can be heard screaming, let's go, let's go, and that he was Jesus, the descendant of God. Oh, you open me. God, keep it going. Because it's good Friday. And you know what? You talk getting rid of all the coppers. Let's go, let's go. I'm enraged! I'm Jesus! I'm descendant of God! And you love me up! Next, he can be seen whizzing down the street, shouting, watch me go, watch this. I'm getting stronger by the second. Watch this! You f***ing... You think I'm strong? Wait until you f***ing meet my Because ultimately, you'll give her an ultimatum. Either listen to Gavin, Mum, or I, you're gonna go to hell. They'll disown you, and so will I. But it's their grandma's. Oh! Ones, that is meant to be. Watch this. Watch me go. You. Watch this. My brothers and sisters, this man driving fast as hell. Like he is, I don't, I don't want to say how much he doing, but he at least doing at least eighty. I don't know, man, but he do through resi residential areas. This is absolutely crazy how reckless he driving. I'm surprised he ain't hit nobody yet. This now, I'm getting stronger and stronger by the second. This erratic driving culminated in a violent collision with a house on Mansfield Road in oh. Nottingham, narrowly missing the startled homeowner who was outside in the process. 
Wow. Undeterred by the crash and the wreckage, Gavin, consumed by delusion, confronted the homeowner, now demanding their car keys with a chilling ultimatum. He said, do you believe in Jesus? Because I am Jesus and I will kill you if you don't give me the keys. This homeowner refused to give him anything. This refusal only fueled Gavin's descent into madness as he hijacked another vehicle who had stopped to help and fled towards Mansfield Woodhouse. The time was now 9.15 a.m. and the police had started getting loads of phone calls about a vehicle that was driving erratically up a road and all over the pedestrian paths. As the police rushed to catch up with him, the ensuing mayhem saw Gavin leave a trail of destruction in his wake. He went on to crash this second stolen car into a set of metal barriers before making his way on foot to a random nearby house in Worcester Avenue. It's just crazy that he didn't crash two cars and live to tell the story about it. You know what I'm saying, man? The way he was driving, you would think he would have died. But there was one thing that I don't know if y'all caught it or not. But during his whole crazy tirade while he was driving in the first car he stole, he started to put that seatbelt on. You know what I'm saying? He didn't think he was Jesus that much. He said, put that seatbelt on to make sure he stayed alive. But it's still crazy, man. You would think he would have died the way he was driving. But he made it through two crashes. Let's see where we're going now. This house had a mother and her two young children inside. Gavin made his way around the back of the house and picked up a huge concrete patio slab. He then used this to smash in the back doors and charge inside this house. In the process of doing this, he cut his hand pretty bad and was bleeding profusely. In a rage, he shouted to the homeowner and threatened her before smearing crucifixes on the windows using his own blood. Again, he then demanded the mother's car keys, to which she of course refused. Gavin then threatened to kill her children if the keys weren't given over, so of course the keys were handed over. Before leaving- And see this is why I just gotta throw a lesson out there, my brothers and sisters, like this is why I just gotta speak my opinion real quick. I know a lot of people out there really don't like guns, but this is one of those uh, situations that shows you. This is an example of why all of us need to practice our Second Amendment in the United States. Because if a mother come in my house acting all crazy, talking about he going to kill my kids, before you get kill my kids out your mouth, you going to be dead. You know what I'm saying, man? And I don't know, maybe this uh, lady didn't have no freaking gun at the time. But this is just one of those times that just I feel like my brothers and my sisters, man, Get y'all some protection, not only for yourself, but your whole freaking family, man. Because you never know who can freaking bust in your house at any freaking time of the day and be doing the most craziness. Leaving, Gavin drew a crucifix on each one of their heads with his blood before leaving the house and hopping into his third stolen car of the day. Gavin put the car into reverse and reversed quite deliberately at some speed and over a considerable distance into bystander, 87-year-old Terry Radford, oh. who was just waiting at the bus stop by his home. Terry, who was a retired teacher and a former magistrate, a much-loved member of his community, and a beloved grandfather, was brutally crushed against the bus shelter. Gavin jumped out of the car and began screaming, I've killed him. I've killed the devil. After this, Gavin went round multiple nearby houses, knocking on the doors and threatening to kill them terrifying everyone. There was even reports that Gavin was wielding a machete. In a final act of defiance, Gavin then jumped back into this stolen vehicle before ramming a police car and driving away. God, this mo- Yeah. An air ambulance arrived at a nearby field within minutes, but sadly, nothing could be done to save Terry's life. He was declared dead right there on the pavement. Soon after making off, the police were actually able to catch Gavin with tasers where he was quickly apprehended. But by now, the damage was done. Oh, 
Get out of the car! Get out of the car! This way! Oh, I'll get him out! He dies! I'll get him out! Oh no! Get rid of that! Get rid of that! Do not move! Do not move! Get him out! Man, I just gotta say this real quick, y'all. Whoever the freak let this man out, they need to be on an investigation or something. Like, whoever in the court of law, judicial system, whatever the terminology or the words are, that let this man out, we, all, we need to check y'all background, y'all history, or make sure that y'all are actually sane because you let an insane mother get out and he did some insane mother things, man. That is just crazy. November of 2019, Gavin appeared at court accused of burglary, aggravated taking of a vehicle, attempted robbery, one kidnapping, and one count of murder. He denied all these charges. He denied murder by reason of insanity. In the trial, the judge revealed that Gavin had since been diagnosed with schizophrenia and a psychoactive disorder. Because of this, his murder charge was dropped to manslaughter. On Wednesday, the 1st of July, 2020, a jury concluded that Gavin was unfit to stand trial for murder, finding him guilty, however, of manslaughter on the grounds of diminished responsibility. Gavin was jailed for manslaughter and handed a life sentence with a minimum term of 21 years. Thank you, man. Thank you, because I was getting worried for a second, my brothers and sisters. I was thinking because they dropped the charge to manslaughter that maybe he wouldn't have got that freaking life in prison. But his ass still got it, and he needed it. And I don't even want to go down a rabbit hole about that he uh he was sick in the head, man, Um, schizophrenia and all that. I mean, hey, as I always say, there are people in this world that do have those medical problems and really do go through that type of mental whatever. But at the end of the day he killed a man so he gotta face the consequences point blank mother and period let's go for the family affected however this did little to quell the horror they were furious that gavin had wormed away from consequences and they were even more angry at the fact that he'd been released at all given his behavior and history of mental illness an investigation and I got to agree with that too, man. I see, because I was looking for a second, man. I'm like, what? The family mad at what? They mad at the fact that this motherfucker should have never been out in the first place to kill their freaking oh, daddy, granddaddy, brother, uncle. You know what I'm saying? Oh, my God, bro. The was opened into why Gavin had been let loose, and it was found that policy was not followed during his release process, finding issues with the governors of the prison and the scheme that allowed him an early release. Now five years on from this horror, Terry's family continue to fight for the justice that they so rightly deserve. They've raised this with their MP, and their MP publicly stated that the governors who let Gavin free should be sacked from their jobs at HMP Ranby and should never be able to serve in the prison service again. I However, agree. at the time of writing this, absolutely nothing has changed with the release scheme nor have any of the governors of the prison been held accountable for letting this insane man back on the streets. That's crazy as hell, man. Now, that shit does some shit that'll piss your ass the fuck off, man. Like I was saying, man, they need to be on an investigation. Then Ryan told us that they did go on an investigation. I feel like somebody need to be fired for that. Now, I'm not going to take it as far as saying they need to go to jail or nothing, but they at least need to be fired. See, this is the corrupt ass shit that be happening in our government, my brothers and sisters. It's the same way with police that be beating down on us in the streets. You know what I'm saying? And they get away with it. They still literally still be working for the same fucking police department with a little slap on the wrist they pro i don't even know these people got a damn slap on the wrist they should at least be fired man y'all let y'all made the decision to let this insane maniac motherfucker back out and this one of those rare times where watching that clip of him driving in that car well i'm looking like this dude literally like for real is crazy because we are watching many videos over here my uh brothers and sisters well People be faking like they crazy. They try to act like they crazy to get a lighter sentence or whatever. But I don't even know if that dude knew that that freaking camera was recording him at that time. But he really was crazy. And it's just a tragedy all the way around that could have been prevented by not letting him out. Long story short, short story long.
Let's get into the last one. Number one. This entry takes us all the way back to India, where on this channel, I've delved into some profoundly tragic and just bizarre occurrences. Yeah. For a man who died ziplining on his ponytail to another yeah. man who was toying with snakes and paid the ultimate price. Yeah. These incidents were undoubtedly crazy and absurd ways to meet one's end. However, the events that I'll be discussing in this entry somehow surpass them all in absurdity and avoidable loss of life by far. This footage was recorded on the evening of October the 19th, 2018, in the city of Amritsar, the second largest city in the Indian state of Punjab. But that night, millions of Hindus across India and across the world were busy celebrating Dashera, a major Hindu festival celebrated at the end of another festival each year. So they have two festivals back to back. Mm. To celebrate Dushera, amongst other things, the main tradition is to burn effigies of the ten-headed demon king Ravana. This supposedly symbolized the victory of good over evil, and these effigies are often huge in size and are packed to the brim with fireworks and other firecrackers. So oh, when it's oh. set alight, it crackles and pops in all different colors creating lots of noise and often attracting huge crowds. That right there reminds me of an old Mr. Balling, y'all. This probably like two years ago when Mr. Balling put that video out about these people in the desert who used to go have like a festival every year, like, like a two-day, three-day festival. And long story short, story long, it was this big monument thing just like that. There was all these feet in the air and the shit blew up or caught on fire. And the man, it was this one man that went and actually was on top of it. Why it blew up? I don't know, y'all, but it reminded me of that, dude. Is man stuff can be so dangerous it i understand why they would think that this is so cool i think it's cool to look at stuff like that but you just never know when stuff just gonna malfunction and i think this is one of those stories as the day went on the streets were filled with laughter and joy and as the night settled many effigies were lit all across amritsa with one in particular being lit on the eastern outskirts attracting a crowd of around a thousand people before this was even lit, however, just due to where the venue was set up and where the effigy was, and the fact that there was a six foot wall around it, around 300 individuals of the crowd overflowed through a small gate and onto a nearby stretch of land that seemed to be elevated. From this vantage point, they could get a better view at the effigy and get better photos and videos. Shockingly, this stretch of land was in fact live train tracks. Ooh. This was something that everyone must have been aware of because they would have been locals, and not to mention you stood on train tracks and there would have been train line infrastructure around, but this didn't seem to bother anyone. It's worth noting that nobody should have been in this area, so technically they were all trespassing. On this stretch of land, around 300 spectators continued watching the firecrackers pop, recording it on their phones, smiling and having a great time, when within a blink of an eye, the darkness was pierced by a blinding light. Was that what I just thought we heard, my brothers and sisters? Was that a train man? I was hoping that I I, didn't, I knew something bad was going to happen, but I was hoping more that the freaking thing would blow up or something. But I think we just heard a train, and these people on this track, and this, this, this darkest freak, and it happened so fast. Oh, my God. Many people looked up to see a commuter train coming in their direction 
Because of the loud sound that the effigy and the crowd were producing, not everyone heard this coming train. Most were able to jump out of the way or hopscotch onto the other track to avoid being hit. As the crowd lurched onto the adjacent track to avoid the oncoming train, before the people could even catch their breath, before they could even process what just happened, a much, much faster second commuter train came flying in the opposite direction. With literally zero time to react, the train plowed into the crowd, wiping out everything in its path. This second train pulled many, many people under it as it swept by, leaving pure devastation in its wake. The train continued flying by as it honked its horn, but it didn't stop. Only when the dust settled did they realize how many people had just been run over. Only then did the horror of the night become clear. People turned to their phone, they put their torch on, to see a scene that I won't even describe here. The train had killed dozens instantly, injuring many, many more. Bodies and limbs lay strewn across the tracks and grassland, some describing it like a bomb had gone off. Emergency services whisked away those who were injured, but this in itself was a huge task, as over 100 people had sustained an injury in some form. Some had their whole leg sliced off, while others had lost hands or whole arms. While the task of getting the injured to hospital was very difficult, the other task of identifying the dead would be a far more laboursome process, as many of the dead were dismembered or mutilated beyond recognition. Man, yo, man, I, hey, man, god damn, man. Ryan ain't lying. He have told many stories about things that have happened over in India and stuff, and I remember those stories, but this one right here is the worst one. Matter of fact, this is the worst train wreck story I have ever heard, man, and we have heard a lot of them over here on our channel, y'all. This is just next level stuff, and it's just the fact of how many people got ran over. By not only one, but two trains, two of them, in the span of a couple of minutes. This one of those one that kind of make me feel numb on the inside, like Jesus, F in Christ. On October the 20th, the day following the accident, locals organized a sit-in protest along that railway, urging officials and the train driver for action, seeking compensation for the victims. Another burning question that many were wondering was why had the effigy been built so close to the tracks? Yes, the people shouldn't have been there, but why was the effigy facing towards the train tracks then? Horribly, on the evening of October the 19th, authorities announced that they had found 50 bodies. However, the following day, nine more bodies were recovered, bringing the official death toll for this entirely avoidable incident to 59. 59 people lost their lives, focusing on a shiny, colourful fire when they should have been paying attention to where they were standing. I know the safety around tracks in India is questionable to say the least, as I covered a story about a man who was weighing on train tracks in India, only to be killed by a flying cow that had been hit by a passing train. Train lines over there just seem to be something that has no respect at all. But to me, it's like this was the perfect recipe for disaster. The tracks the effigy muting the noise of the oncoming trains, it's almost unbelievable. According to reports, the driver reported the incident when he arrived back at the station, so he didn't even stop. Upon questioning, he claimed that he'd received a green signal and was completely unaware of the hundreds of people on the tracks. He said that he'd applied the emergency brakes and that he did honk his horn, but by then it was just too late. In his defense, the Minister of State for Railways for India stated that the railway administration was not notified of the festival's location or timing. He deemed it a clear case of trespassing, and when questioned about why the train didn't halt or decelerate upon approaching, this official cited that dense smoke was obscuring visibility and added that the driver was navigating a curve, he came round the curve and then saw the crowd. And I gotta say too, y'all, man, I man, this is just this this one right here hit hard. Like this one right here, dude. But I just gotta say, man, that I believe that um uh, the company of the train uh that that 
hit these people. The freaking dude who was driving the train. This was not intentional. I feel like this was a complete accident. And they, they I don't think they're lying when they saying that they didn't know nothing about this festival going on. You know what I'm saying, man? Because these people was technically trespassing. They ain't supposed to been back there. But another effed up thing about that is I feel like not everybody back there knew that they was really trespassing. You know what I'm saying? You know how sometimes that some, one of your friends or a family member or somebody will invite you to something and you would go to, with them, but you really don't have the full details of what it entails or what's going on. Some people probably went back there not even knowing they trespassing. They just going because they friend or they family invited them and they just back there on the train tracks thinking now everything all good. Then they look up and they hit. And I just really feel like this was a freaking accident, man. I don't feel like them freaking train people really tried to hit them. I feel like it was nighttime for number one. You get up. On, it take a long time for a freaking uh, train to stop. You just can't hit on the brakes like a train like you can a car and it just come to a screech and stop. No, it's going to slow down, but it still got a ways to go before it can stop, man. So I just long story short, short story long. Feel like this was an accident, y'all. And it is just a terrible accident. Railways Minister of State refuted any negligence on the driver's part and declared that no action would be taken against him. At this time, the Indian Prime Minister announced a two lakh compensation to the families of the dead, equal to around 1,900 Great British Pounds, or around 2,400 US dollars, and they also awarded 50,000 rupees to the injured. So, next time you're in the dark and you're watching fireworks, and you think, I'm going to get a better view, just be careful where you're standing on. Make sure you're not standing on a train track. Because this was bloody horrific. Man. But that is the end of the video. May the 59 people that perished in this horrible train accident, and the rest of the people featured in this video, rest in peace. Rest in peace. But holy hell, this one was crazy. I've no idea how I keep managing to find these wild clips that I've never seen before. Most of these cases didn't even reach international news. Most of them I only found out due to comments or very hard research. The Florida plane crash onto Interstate 75 was bizarre and just kind of unbelievable. Experiencing dual engine failure at the exact same time. Seriously, what are the chances? It goes to show that when your time is up, it's up. The pilots did an amazing job at saving the lives of their passengers. If it weren't for their quick actions, I'd say that everyone on that jet would have died that day. The men who dared to break a world record only to be swept up into power lines is shocking and just horribly crazy. The video shows that literally within seconds, the balloon swept up with the wind into the power lines. It does make me wonder why balloonists don't wear a parachute or something for emergencies just in case something goes wrong. This one, I've got to say, is just an act of God, I guess. Unless there's a forecast that I couldn't find that forecasts the bad wind, then it's poor planning. The chopper that crashed on the way to the wedding venue was terrifying. I would have been so scared in those final moments. With fog in all directions, they could have been 500 feet up or 50 feet up. There was no telling what was what, and it's no wonder that the pilot got disorientated. It's bloody tragic that nobody survived and it's sad that the husband was stood at the altar waiting not knowing that the love of his life had perished in a helicopter crash gavin who went on a joyride and took the life of innocent terry truly abhorrent i understand that he was going through a mental episode at the time that doesn't make the footage and the things that he did any less shocking however if the prison system had done its job effectively and not let this dangerous criminal out on the streets, Terry would almost certainly still be with us today. I personally hope that the governors get the sack for releasing him, but of course, nothing's happened as of yet, and I doubt anything will happen. And last but not least, the crowd in India being hit by two trains. What do I even say? This whole situation is crazy. Completely crazy and tragically avoidable. The fact that 59 people lost their lives watching an effigy stood on train tracks is ridiculous and horrific. 
But most importantly, what did you think of this one? As always, I read every single comment below, even the nasty ones, and I know my upload schedule's been completely whack recently. So if you're this far in and you've not subscribed, why not go down there and tap that like and subscribe button. And don't forget to click the notification bell to be immediately alerted when I release content such as this. But I will see you guys in the next one. Bye bye. Oh my God, my brothers and sisters. This is probably the worst tragedy tales that we have ever watched this in a, in a good way. Well, I don't even know if I should say a good way, but y'all know what I'm saying, man. Like, this one hit the hardest, dude. All these freaking stores, my brothers and sisters, just like, was just hitting my heart, man. They so freaking tragic. And it's real freaking life out here, man. It's real life, y'all. And all these freaking stores could have happened to any of us. It can happen to anybody. You know what I'm saying? You can be touched. Like, anybody could literally be touched. And when they get touched, poof, your life gone. You know what I'm saying? God, I don't know, man. God, I just feel like it's just a freaking counter. A uh, freaking countdown timer on our life, man. And when it and when it run out, we get that touch and we gone. And some of these way these people died, it's just like, man, what is the chances of that ish happening? Let's go through it real quick. Let's go through it real quick. Number five was the people who got ran over with the train, man. It's just like, dude, bro. I, 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 I don't think that it was intentional at all. I think it was just a terrible accident. Those people should have never been on those freaking train tracks. The freaking train people never even knew nothing about them being on the train track. It's nighttime. You know what I'm saying? Trains can't just stop at the stop of a dime. It just was just terrible, man. 59 people, man. The freaking fourth one. I, I, I Like uh, Ryan said at the end, and I said it too, man. Those people who let this dude get out this crazy maniac the picture is so perfect as far as the writing is so on the raw it's so crisp it's in 4k you literally can see that this man is a freaking crazy ass murderer and you still let him back out on the streets like you literally can see that this man one day will murder somebody it's all there and you still let him back out on the streets and what happened he murdered that dude on his just ridiculous rampage, man. Rest in peace of that guy that died right there. Um, the third one, uh, we I already seen that one before on Lazy Man channel, but watching it again with Ryan, it just still just hit me just as hard, man. It's just like the, the fact that this lady was trying to do something on her wedding day. You know what I'm saying? Something that she always dreamed of doing. Then not only her, but she had three more people with her, and one of those people, the other lady, was freaking pregnant. So you might as well say like five lives lost their lives then. You know what I'm saying, man? It's just like her freaking husband, the family, all the friends sitting up there waiting, waiting on her to arrive. And then you get the news that she died in a freaking helicopter crash. And then seeing the freaking visual of not being able to see out of the window, the windshield or whatever. It is just, man, Jesus Christ, what could you do in that situation, man? Rest in peace to those four, too. Number two was uh, the balloon, the high air balloon thing. It, now, that one was the one where it really seemed like it was daytime to freaking go, man. Just the fact that the balloon looked like it landed safe. It did. But then all of a sudden, the freaking air before they can get out of the damn balloon, just those little seconds that if it would have just lasted, if that freaking high air balloon would have stayed on the ground for, let's just say, 30 seconds longer or somewhere up in there, they could have potentially got out. But it's like as soon as it hit the ground, it just start flying back up. You know what I'm saying? And we watching this, and it don't look as fast and as strong and as powerful as it actually is happening while they're inside that high air balloon, man. And it took them back up, but not only did it take them back up, it took them into a freaking power line. And they burned to death. Shock, got shocked, whatever, man. It don't matter, man. Jesus Christ. I'm telling y'all, man, all these just been crazy. And the first one we watched, 
it just, man, I done said it a lot of times, man. Stuff like this just make you wonder, like, are you going to be riding down the street one day and see a freaking airplane? Because we have watched a lot of these from Ryan about these freaking airplanes, man, crashing on the highway and stuff, man. And the one thing, this is the beautiful, most beautiful thing about this. It's still a tragedy tale, but the beautiful thing is, man, that those two freaking pilots, even though they lost, they lost their lives, they made sure that all those passengers still kept their lives man but just watching that visual of that plane crashing on that highway and thank god that it didn't crash into a lot of other those other cars because it was a lot of cars around that could have got blown up too man it was terrible but i feel like it 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 it, 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 it sound elfed up to say but i know y'all understand what i'm saying man it could have been a lot worse it could have been a lot worse than what it actually was but I digress. I'm going to go and let y'all go now, my brothers and sisters. We have most definitely been here long enough. But like I said, man, every time we watch Ryan from Tragedy Tales, it feels like a special occasion. And I really enjoyed today being here with y'all. Y'all just please, 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 please hit that like button, comment, and subscribe if you ain't did that yet. Come on, join the Bean Team, man. The Bean freaking team. And make sure that you come on back tomorrow. For another That Chapter Wednesday. But until then, my friends, also remember this. Love, peace, and happiness. Stay safe. Don't stop. Keep going. Yeah.